Hello everyone, I'm Hill, here with Bill Radish, old, a very old friend, old longtime friend of mine, um, and we're going to try the first ever, what we call these, overseer conversations? Yes, or okay. perspectives on Harvard. Perspectives on Harvard, and you know, my, the idea here is I'm making this bid to be added to the ballot of the Harvard Board of Overseers, as you watching may or may not know, and I thought as part of that, you know, we can put out position piece and reach out to people, but sometimes it's good to just have conversations with, you know, Harvard alums and people who know the communities, kind of hear what they're thinking and just kind of riff on uh, on what's going on and where to go with things. So with that, Bill, you know, you've been a real, you know, advisor to me in terms of thinking about this and, and kind of what the overseers do and don't do and then, you know, how to how to affect change at the university and I appreciate you joining. <laughs> yeah, and being my first victim in this format of figuring out. I mean, I spent 11 years at Harvard. For six of them, I was the staff assistant to the Committee on Social Studies of the Board of Overseers. I mean, at one point, I had 14 titles, uh, which uh, is- Did you get paid 14 of, times? What? Same Did time. you get paid 14? Yeah. Well, well yeah, but, but a lot of them didn't pay a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but it, basically, that's how Harvard controlled you, because if you didn't get all these jobs, then Harvard didn't pay you enough. Right, you needed Got the it. you needed the other the the other things. So, uh, but I, I lived through. I did the process for merging male and female admissions, and I was the assistant dean at that time. I ran all the computer systems, and we did the process. And I look back at that, and the whole concern was one thing: was the process fair? Yeah. Not was the outcome going to be preordained was the process. Yep. And we went to enormous lengths to make sure that it would be fair. I mean, we yep. randomly assigned using an, a random number generator who read every folder. So yep. there was no, it used to be a staff person decided that. Uh, we randomly put it out there. We ran, I mean, everything was done so that no one could argue about the process and yep. therefore at the end, nobody did. I, I mean, yep. uh, and I just think that DEI, because it inherently is anti-merit and says mm -hmm. that the outcome is the only thing that matters, even if the process is fair, um, you've got, it's just inherently, I think, in conflict with a lot of what the university should stand for. Yeah. So, you know, it makes sense. I mean, for me, the, the whole thing, and this has been, I mean, as you and I have discussed at length, the, the thing for me has been, you know, a lot, especially since October 7th and seeing kind of how the university has handled this. You know, I'm a huge free speech advocate. We talk about the process being fair. I'm a huge free speech advocate. Yes. If Harvard fully embraced free speech, I, I am like up to the line of student safety. I, I actually... score doesn't support that? The worst I, thing just, you know, in just, the country? <laughs> You know, it, it, yeah, that's a little upsetting. I mean, the, the reality is, is, is like that can be a policy to your point. It can like if it's clearly articulated and clearly and consistently enforced, makes a lot of sense. On the flip side, you know, like I'm not as much a fan of like speech codes of conduct, for instance. But I understand the rationality, like if that's the direction that you know everyone agrees on going in. Like it's not wouldn't be my preference, but I understand. What I don't understand is inconsistent application and enforcement, right? Uh, and and that's what I think is one of the things that I find super challenging um, to be so front and center in such an important way, uh, you know, kind of this fall. Uh, and it is, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts I and mean, you have so much more perspective than I do about, like, how did we get to this place? And then what do you do to move forward? Well, I mean, if, if you saw Bill Maher uh, a week ago, you know, the, the thing he said is that, um, Okay, when you get to the margins, if you put up a sign that says "fuck the Jews," mm -hmm. it, it, you know, and that, and that is okay. But what if I change Jews to another ethnic group? Uh, is, is it okay, no matter what ethnic group? And he goes, "I don't think anyone really believes that. That had yeah. you put another group by anything, uh, it would have been seen as a violation." And I mean that, you know. But, He's a smart guy, and it was a very good show on on all these issues. But uh, yeah, I've heard that question posed by a lot of different people, right? And I haven't heard any good answers to it. You know, part, there's a small part of me that wonders if some very enterprising students shouldn't try some of that 
to make the point. But the flip side is, and this is the whole thing I feel is like, I would never want students to sacrifice their futures that way. Right. Well, it mean, seems like, like no. a picture of you carrying a sign saying, you know, a hundred percent. So it's tough. Yeah, Cause you're like, I, not what I think, you mean. Bill Maher wouldn't say it. Cause he said, somebody's going to clip it. And then that's how I'll get defined for, for the rest of the, uh, of eternity. Um, well, I mean, Harvard discipline has always been a mystery, right? I mean, most students were disciplined for conduct on becoming a Harvard student. Now, if you talk about a, a vague, uh, a vague rule, um, anything could be conduct on becoming, uh, yeah. uh and, uh, so, but yeah, I don't, but is it the faculty too? I mean, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the faculty, you know, I don't know what their political views are, but I don't think they're conservative. Uh, I don't, I mean, yeah, I don't even know where they stand on free speech, you know, or. So how is this evolved? Because I, I mean, look, I'll tell you from my perspective, and I'm curious if you think this is the right or the wrong way to think about it, which is, you know, actually, uh, is this feels like it's become more of an issue over time because the limelight has been more on Harvard. Like as Harvard's brand has grown, right, all of a sudden it represents so much more and people want to use it in various ways versus it, you know, if you unroll the clock, I mean, I, I graduated 20 years ago, obviously, that's a blink of the eye in the history of Harvard, but, you know, it's still meaningful time on a chronological basis. And, you know, you'd say that it was even then less of a brand, right, globally, right, than it is today. Is it partially that people want to use it politically or that because it's in the limelight, it has to operate differently now? I mean, I left Harvard in 77. Um, and Harvard worried a lot then about being a leader of the world by example. Mm -hmm. But it was leading the world by example. It seems to me that particularly on these DEI issues, Harvard wants to change the world. Harvard views its mission not as educating students and doing so in a compatible way, but really trying to drive society to change it. And I think that, I mean, The Economist has an article on that this week about how universities need to go back to doing what their job is and quit trying to change society because they, after all, in the end, are wonderful benefits. They live at the top and get all sorts of things. But Well, and it's interesting. I mean, there's this idea that the academy, like it's, it's a tough situation because I actually really respect the faculty and university saying like part of our job is to stand apart outside the political process. I actually agree with that. Again, like I think it's one of the bulwarks, you know, saying like we, it doesn't matter what's going on in Washington, we stand apart, we do our job, which is the academic excellence mission that we have at our core. The problem and the interesting challenge is it seems like, you know, weaponizing that or saying actually, no, 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 we don't stand apart. But we're going to lead from being apart. And like, you know, we are in the political game becomes a really challenging thing and kind of basically in some ways it undercuts the academic freedom mission of trying to stand apart and be kind of the consistent uh, truth seekers in our society. I mean, I, I think Sam, you from you relate to this. I, I never believed in double bottom lines. I and, do relate to that. <laughs> and what has changed in Harvard is it's a double bottom line now. It seems as if you, you're going to do DEI and academic excellence. And I've never I've never seen an organization succeed that tries to do both. They end up and then people- Well, the question is how do you trade one bottom line off the other, right? Is what it ends up being. Because they're happy, you can't- if, if, if You fail because you don't know how to make the trade-offs. And only one yeah. person can make the trade-offs at the end, which is the, the apex leader. Uh, yeah. And that's- And that's very challenging for any organization. You know, one thing I learned in my career so far, right? Largely in technology is this, is we actually talking about it yesterday on a podcast I was doing with my wife, I'm also a Harvard grad and a few other folks, is this idea that if you have um, a number, right, or a single thing you're driving, it's actually quite freeing to an organization. You say like, our job is academic excellence full stop. Yeah. Great, everyone can think about how to achieve that, right, in their own way and things like that. The second you have not clearly articulated principles or you have multiple things in the balance and no one can make that trade except for the executives or the people, you know, at some very senior level, it's very constraining to the organ people in the organization and to actual freedom because you say, well, I can't make this call. I have to kick it up the line, which creates a terrible working environment for everyone, right? Because all of a sudden there's no true north. There's no thing you're actually shooting for. It's just whoever is in charge, what they say, right? And that's, I think, big reason for me that I really believe 
you know, I saw this firsthand in, you know, in growing Facebook at, at, in platforms is if you have a large platform that's complicated, that has lots of different components and you're trying to achieve goals, right? You know, one of the most important things to do is to have clearly legible, articulate rules that are evenly enforced, that are the same everywhere, with the same frameworks of what success looks like so that you can actually empower everyone in the organization as opposed to saying, well, there's no empowerment. It's just whatever some people choose to think, right, is kind of the ultimate answer, right, well, which is very disempowering. I mean, that's Harvard right now, DEI. Yeah. I think, yeah. So let's, can we be optimists for a second? I mean, like, again, as uh, so many of my friends, everyone's written off the university. They say, we're just not going to do it anymore. We're done. We're going to go try to do other, you know, build up other universities. It's not savable. Am yeah, I crazy to be savable? Uh, I, 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 I mean, they don't need donations for a long time. Uh, yeah. They can do just fine. Uh, so... Financial is not going to be a leverage on lever on them, which, you know, me, you know, the reason I don't know, I should say, you know, I wrote this article on Harvard admissions and uh, it was accepted in 1978. Harvard magazine was going to publish it. And I got a phone call from Henry Rosofsky, who was the dean of the faculty and a friend. And he goes, just read your article. So there was no uh, editorial independence, obviously. And it's very good. It's factual. It's correct. Please don't publish it. <laughs> uh, and I just did. Uh, but it's, you know, 45 years later. But Harvard depends on people believing it's the best. And if people don't believe it's the best, then Harvard could fall very quickly, very fast. Yeah. And, and, and that's the issue, I think. And the more that they identify themselves with an ideology and something that people perceive as an ideology, even if its proponents say it's not, it doesn't matter. The people, people see it that way. I mean, it's the, the comment that uh, former Governor Cuomo made about uh, Trump and, and the trials. He goes, look, 80% of the public thinks that the prosecutions are politically motivated. You may not, but that doesn't matter. The, the public does. It's the same thing. I mean, DEI yeah. looks like an ideology, and to the extent to which you get identified with an ideology, then you begin to lose the perception that Harvard is the best. And yeah, and that is a funny. I was, I, was, I was playing tennis this morning with a Harvard grad who's also a Penn grad and a few other things, and, and he has children who are now, you know, one's in college, one's, one's looking, is about to do it. He's, 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 he's talking about what we're trying to do here, the overseers thing, and he's saying, Sam, I think you don't get it. It's like the students, the best kids already don't want to go to Harvard. Right. They're like they're kind of over it. Right. They think they see it as kind of, you know, you know, out in the, in the spectrum and they're, they're choosing to go to other places. You know, the best the best, you know, employers don't want to hire from Harvard anymore. They're looking at state schools and everywhere else. Right. But, you know, his kind of point to me was don't do this. It's not worth your time. I'm not sure I agree with that part, but it's um, but it, I think to your point about perception of being the best, it is important. And academic excellence coming first is important. I mean, it's, it's, it's critical and, you know, and it had the best faculty and it had, you know, it, 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 the most learning and all the research institutes. I mean, but it, it, I mean, look, a lot of it's done at the, you know, the admissions level was making sure that the kids you took were perceived in the community as being the best kids. Maybe not the highest yeah. grades, maybe not. That was never the strategy. Uh, maximizing yeah. the board scores would have been a, a horrible place to be. Uh, right. I mean... You know, the whole the whole theme in admissions when I was there and I thought it's changed is you had to have something that could get your self-esteem. Admitting someone to Harvard who didn't have a way to get self-esteem in that community was starting a disaster because mm -hmm. a kid that can't find self-esteem becomes, you know, a problem child. Fair and enough. That, you know, but, you know, at the same time, you could do that and you could take, you know, literally the best. There's no question. I mean, look, I mean. One day I was sitting in my office as assistant dean of admissions and a friend from MIT came over and he, I had the data, he had the data and we compared and, and the, the issue was that on most objective criteria, you, you couldn't find the difference between the Harvard class and the MIT class. But the Harvard kids made three times as much over their lifetime as the MIT kids. That's because they rose to their level. That's because they rose to their level of incompetence, right? Okay. Yeah, well, 
I, I mean, and so his question was, why? Yeah. What What is it? I don't know. I mean, his conclusion was that MIT graded differently. MIT, you earned your grade in piecemeal portions where Harvard, everything wrote on the exam or the paper or maybe both, but you were forced to integrate on your own and you got used to having there being one big test and nobody really cared what you did during the term. But on the other hand, they did at the end in the in an exam. Uh, I don't know how much how true that is. I mean, grades have gone up dramatically since uh, since I was there. Um, Believe it or not, they've gone up even since I was there. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting one. And this goes back to the whole thing. I mean, maybe that, to, to wrap it up, but, but I, I, I think this is a kind of an interesting area to explore, which is like, this goes back to the whole question of what's the mission of the university? Because even in my day, I like the idea that the admission, the, the part of the mission of the university is to train the next generation of leaders like that, that, that resonates to me. Right. Um, but the question of saying, well, if we're training the leaders, we should also be picking them is different from saying we're, we are training the next generation of leaders, but, but in some ways we're an academic institution, right. And our goal is academics. It just happens that there's a high correlation between that and, uh, and their ultimate success. You're on a very fundamental question is what makes you different as a Harvard grad or the students you go to school with? That I agree with. And it's like, you know, it's the ingredients you put into the cake, not just, the, you know, you can have the same recipe, but it is, the, and, and that's where the secret sauce always was. I mean, the number of people who are still incredibly close friends as freshman roommates uh, you know, well, look, I spoke to my freshman roommate three days ago. I'm married to my junior girl, my junior year girlfriend, right? I, I yeah. spent almost my, my, almost my entire professional career working with friends and classmates from Harvard. So I completely understand. <laughs> and, and that, that is the, you know, I mean, the, the two friends used to do the rooming and, uh, one year they put bear, fox and rabbit in the same room. Uh, it's got a, a lot of calls into the Dean of Freshmen that this was not an accident and he had to keep saying it was, but of course it wasn't, it was a product of too many gin and tonics, I think, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that chemistry. I mean, you, you're putting together the chemistry and that, that has always been, I think, the, the, what makes Harvard different. I mean, it's not, you know, that, I mean, the, but there aren't, I mean, at the time that I was doing admissions, there were about 30 double eight hundreds in the country on SATs, but I think Harvard probably had 20 of them. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it, it did get the best and the brightest, but it then had a way to have them mix in a way that they could reinforce each other and teach each other. And that's what yeah. made it a special place. And the question is, are they losing that now by imposing an ideology on top of that environment? and changing to a double bottom line company from, you know, a single bottom line, which was excellence in education. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Well, I think that's a great, I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time, Bill, but that is a great Any note time. to end on. And Good I, luck. I for sure, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you participating in my experiment here. And, um, and uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I really value your capital. Purpose. Don't, don't. Sorry? Don't it's it's an, it, it don't um, oh no i want to be clear the experiment is not running for overseers the, that's serious the experiment is doing live videos with alums in different from and from different classes and okay. seeing oh, you know, that's the experiment yeah, good, good, good clarification Riverside. no this is not an experiment i mean for me to, to give the closing stump speech it's, you know i do want to add some intellectual diversity and background diversity to the board of overseers i do think that there's a lot that from the private sector having built platforms and worked on them before you know, that Harvard needs to be wrestling with. And look, I do believe fundamentally in student safety, creating a, a platform that is consistent in its rules and applications of those rules so that people can do their best work. Um, and I believe in it as an academic institution. That's kind of where it, where it, where it all nuts out. Great. Okay. Thank you. You're my best suggestion. I, I absolutely Take will. Care. Great to see you. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Bye.